I oftentimes find people's uh, minds are stimulated uh, after a day of my presentations and sometimes they have questions and comments in the morning. So uh, before I jump into the agenda for the day, I'd be really happy to hear uh, what is on top, what people have been thinking about, what they've been you know, cogitating, uh, insights, anything you want to share? Uh, so when we're doing, when we're looking at the soil test, we take the, uh, what, it, what it's supposed to be, and multiply it by two. Mm -hmm. And then what shows up on our soil test, multiply that by two, and then subtract that from the first number. Mm -hmm. And then we have to get the uh, percentage of whatever it is that we're gonna, we want to amend it with. And then divide that into the, the lower number, and that gives us our uh, pounds needed of that material per acre. Per acre. Mm -hmm. that's, that's and then the final step is the max application rate per year. Right. To make sure I'm not going over the maximum application rate. Yeah, it's okay. All right, that's cool. Thank you. That sounds like you got it. <laughs> very, very concise. Yeah. Did you say all the information is on your website for? getting a chapter started? Certainly we do have a chapter uh, coordinator whose name is Gary um, and anybody who's interested, um, I, I don't know, maybe you want to, if there, I, I, a couple people have sort of murmured, <coughs> murmured interest to me so far. So maybe it would be good if people want to, uh, during lunch, uh, sit down together and, and have a sort of an informal, um, you know, straw poll of who's interested in, in proceeding forward. Um, I would be happy to um, sit down with you or, or make introductions or get out of the way or, or, or whatever uh, as, as seems appropriate. Is there anybody else here who's interested in being involved in some sort of a further one, two, three, four? Well, five. involved, but not the leader. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in charge. I'll show up. Right? I'm not in charge. If we don't have somebody who's going to make it happen, it doesn't end up happening. So. Well, I, I do do some. Uh, writing for a seed company and that kind of stuff and I am involved in a number of other organizations. I wouldn't necessarily want to be president, yeah. but I will will do a lot of the be happy to do a portion of the work. Why don't you why don't you um, remind me right before the lunch break and we'll or we can just say maybe people who are interested in the chapter can can you know meet out meet outside and we can have an informal chat about that. Thank you for bringing that up. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, yesterday you said um, a max for aluminum. What was the target? Uh, the target al aluminum is 200. You want to be below 200. Um, and most people's soils, at least around Appalachia, in my experience, are well above that, um, 800, 1,000, 1,200. Um, and you will see that uh, drop over time as the biological activity increases and they basically sequester it. So watching aluminum levels over time is a good way of assessing relative functioning, relative function of the system. Um, and silica, you said above? Above 50. Um, and if, it, if your silica is low, uh, that's a, always a good excuse to use rock dust. Okay. Yeah. Yesterday you talked about a one-in-one -one ratio between fungal and, and uh, bacterial. Are yeah. you going to be talking today about how one is pushes it one way or the other? How do you push it from uh, bacterial to fungal or fungal to bacterial? Um, I think we said yesterday the best way to get it from fungal to bacterial is to till the soil. Um, <laughs> and the best way to get it from bacterial to fungal is to let it be. And how does one know if it's one to one? Uh, you can send off samples to labs and get them assessed. It, it, it is what it is, basically. I mean, I don't ever, I've never tested my soil um, as far as that is concerned. Um, the basic understanding is that soil evolves over time from bacterial dominance to fungal dominance, and if you just let it be, it will move in that direction. And so uh, one of the bit stronger arguments for minimizing disturbance, minimizing tillage, is that you do functionally push it towards bacterial dominance, which um, will pretty much guarantee you, um, you know, greater susceptibility to infestation and disease because you aren't getting those complex compounds in the plant that correlate with flavor and aroma that really only come when the fungal, fungal levels are, are, are in good shape. So um, strategically, it's really wise to have that fungal dominance because it correlates with all these other 
it's actually, it's actually foundational. Only when you have that beautiful mycelial web, you know, sourcing and sharing and moving and um, building, do you, are, do you, are you able to have the plants build those complex compounds um, that correlate with pest and disease resistance? It's really hard to do that, almost impossible, in a tilled, tilled environment, a deeply regularly tilled environment. Yeah. Good enough or? Mm -hmm. Yeah? All right. <laughs>
in the winter. Uh, either, I mean, if it's not gr green growing with cover crops, which is definitely the best thing to have, uh, then a good mulch. Uh, leaves, hay, straw, wood chips, I don't particularly care what it is. Um, but uh, I think I made a comment yesterday about the soil being bare, being disrobed and things. Um, yeah, in general, keeping the soil covered is a foundational, a foundational piece of the puzzle, as far as I'm concerned. Um, maybe she likes to take her clothes off, you know, once a, one week a month or one week in the year or, you know. For me, it's like, my, 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 my sort of thought is, I'd like to see the soil less than two weeks in the year. That's the standard I've set for myself. Because there are times when you're preparing, you're preparing the ground and planting and it takes a few days for things to get up and, you know, there's, there are some moments when if you're doing annuals, you're going to be seeing the soil. But let's try to keep it as little as possible. Um, um, and, you know, the off off-season period, you should really have something something on there to keep it so alive. you're not yanking off mulch to let the soil heat up before you put in your squash seedlings? No. So if you plant with a cover crop, does that cover crop kind of die away into <coughs> the following season and you're just <laughs> planting through that cover crop? We didn't talk about that process uh, yesterday. Um, where I live, we have this thing called winter. I did talk about that. Um, <laughs> It's a little mild right here. It's, I wouldn't, it doesn't quite count as, I wouldn't define it as winter, but it's all relative. Yeah. Somebody said it gets into the 20s. I'm like, ooh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Time to put a long sleeve shirt on. <laughs> He's just jealous. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, that's exactly what it is. I'm just jealous. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, I try to hide it, but yeah, it, it, does, it does come out at times. Um, so winter killing cover crops like oats and um, forage radishes and uh, field peas are the kind of things that will, if you get them established early and they get to grow well and you know, get to a, a, good, a good height, um, you know, 10, 15 degrees in the wintertime is usually, I mean, that'll definitely kill them. I'm not sure about, I don't think 20 will do it. Um, so depending on your microclimate, maybe, um, that would be something to be considering. Uh, there's overwintering cover crops and winter killing cover crops is, a f is, like, is like one foundational um, difference in cover crops. And so I like to suggest, and I don't know about the details of the microclimates, but if you, if you don't get below 20, this, the overwintering, oh sorry, the winter killing might not winter kill. So then that is what I'm saying would be, would be off. But um, if you do get down to 10 or 15 degrees in the winter time, um, and you put the, the winter killing cover crops in <clears throat> end of August, middle of September, they get up to a good solid height, you know, three, four feet, nice, solid, good looking cover crops. They will get killed in the, f in the winter by the cold, by the snow. You do have snow sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, and they'll be basically lay down and be a wonderful mulch layer with all the root systems still intact. And so I generally suggest that people use the winter killing cover crops in areas where they're planning on doing their spring plantings. Anything like, um, you know, uh, peas, onions, spinach, um, uh, brassicas, carrots, beets, anything that's not, that you would put in before the last frost, um, you know, ideally would be planted into areas where you had winter killing cover crops. Um, that's not an issue. The issue is the overwintering cover crops. Yeah. Is your seeding rate going to be about the same as it would be if you were putting the that down in the spring, or are you seeding? Yeah, like for oats specifically, because I find that if I sow at a certain rate, my my cover crop stand is still kind of thin. You know, I'll get three foot. I just won't have a lot of tillers on that. Mm -hmm. And so, are you sowing at a at a heavier rate? Because it sounds I'm feeling like that's what I'm going to end up doing to get the kind of cover I want. Um, I don't. You know, I do it all by hand, so I don't actually know how many pounds per acre I'm using at the seeding is with a five gallon bucket. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I probably am doing it at a heavier level than the recommended, you know, 28 pounds per acre of you know, oats and things like that. I'm, I'm pretty sure I am doing significantly thicker than that. Yeah. Um, the uh, overwintering cover crops, people have heard about the roller crimper and all that stuff. Um, obviously it works on the grains, doesn't really work on uh, vetch and clover very well. So, um, um, as far as I'm concerned, if you are able to keep your soil alive, growing um, from, uh, say, September, October, whenever the, your crops are dying, all the way through until uh, May, when you're putting in your warm weather plants, 
that's a significant value. Um, so so uh, if, if the logistics of, of crimping a cover crop are, are too much, I guess it depends on people's logistics, what, what kind of uh, infrastructure you have, uh, how big your garden is, how much you can play around with, you know, mulching things down heavily in the bed um, two weeks before you plant, and so things begin to die back, and, and you can plant into that. If you're operating on scale, um, you know, acres, uh, uh, um, a rotary mower, uh, a flail mower uh, coming through, do it, you know, basically just shred the, shred the organic matter the, the, on t above the ground and then, and then a shallow till um, of an inch or an inch and a half. It should be enough to uh, basically kill the plant without really destroying the structure of the soil. Um, you know, it's a massive suite of up nuances, right? There's so many different options we can talk about going down. Just each case has five subcases. So um, in general, the concept is keep your soil covered as much as possible. Um, green is better than brown. Um, logistics are what logistics are. Don't beat yourself up. That's not going to help anybody. Um, um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's a s sufficient commentary. So yeah. would you want to terminate that crop, say like uh, clover, <coughs> which I've got planted now as a cover crop, would I want to, before, it's, it's starting to flower now where mm -hmm. I live, uh, so would I want to terminate that before it flowers, uh, and, or just mm -hmm. let it go and let it flower? I think clover is a wonderful understory plant. I mean, depending on whether it's red clover or white clover, um, it can work well in, you know, Red clover in lettuce isn't going to work very well, but red clover in tomatoes is awesome. So, what are you planning on having there um, in well, the garden? In the area I'm talking about, I'm not going to, I'm not going to even plant it. I'm just going to try to keep it covered all summer. Then, uh, yeah, terminating. Huh? I, I would leave, I let it be. I was going to, you know, I was, what I was thinking I was going to do is, is somehow cut it down, scythe it down or something, and then plant buckwheat and uh, cow peas and, you know, a, a warm weather. Uh, because eventually the clover is going to die when it gets hot anyway. Really? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it, it summer kills pretty, <clears throat> pretty bad or, or burns it back, don't it? Yeah. It's, 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 even the white clover. The white clover is the best. And it it's shorter. But uh, Summer kills red clover. That's, I've never heard that before. It does down south, man. I'm yeah. telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Not here. We got, we, got, we got differences of opinion. Different yeah, microclimates. Yeah, so if I mean you know the you know the successions in time, you know what happens normally. I would say um, getting my cover crop seed out there before uh, scything down the the, the clover, um, let that fall down and be like a like a um, like a light mulch to keep it covered. Uh, I would ideally do that before it's going to rain for a couple of days. I would say you can probably you can probably broadcast the seed, um, come through and, and knock down the knock down the material. Uh, in a rainy day, and, and you can have that transition happen without any disturbance of the soil. Um, entirely possible. Yeah. Yes. Yesterday you talked about how you ha you have a raised beds at your farm, and uh, you build them up, and then you just have a divot between. Yeah. We do that too. Um, in the spring, do you have to flip um, material back on. Like, do you have to do you use a machine the, to flip the beds to reshape them? Yeah. Um, I oftentimes I'm doing it last thing in the fall. Um, I've got a bed former in the back of my tractor, so right before the ground freezes, um, I do that. It depends on lo logistics. Um, and then I, um, the tops are already planted, um, so you're just coming through and re-upping the, re the pathways. Then maybe I'll come through and do some wood chips after the ground freezes in the past to sort of hold them in and keep them stable. Um, it's, a, it's an evolving yeah, process. And then you leave the chips in place through the season? Yeah. And then <clears throat> when you have to reshape, does that throw chips onto your bed then later? Um, yeah. Some say I, I mean, I don't re-up the beds every year. In many cases, it's you know, certainly probably every two years I'll come through and, and re-up them. Um, and uh, by that time, the chips are fairly well broken down. Um, I don't have any problem with chips being on top of the bed. That's the question. Mm -hmm. We started doing that too, and I was just wondering how, how you did it. Yeah, it's all, I mean, there is no one thing, right? It's all, anybody farmers here? <laughs> right? There's never like a, this is how, I mean, at least in my world, it's all, it's all about the moment and what's working, what's not working, and what needs to happen, what should happen. I mean, 
there's a massive set of contingencies or you know deciding factors. But um, yeah, as, as far as wood chips are concerned, um, I'm not sure if I said this yesterday. I don't think I did. Uh, I have historically been reticent to use wood chips, um, and you know personally using um, mulch, mulch hay primarily. Uh, but this past year, we had a pretty significant drought, and there was no hay. What hay there was didn't get rained on, so there was no mulch hay for sure. Um, uh, so wood chips were the next free material. And um, for lack of anything else to use, we started using wood chips. And I was very impressed with fresh wood chips and the color of green on plants and the not adding nitrogen in the, I'm like, I thought wood chips were supposed to suck nitrogen out of the soil. I thought aged wood chips were maybe okay, but fresh wood chips were not okay. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I um, <clears throat> depending on what you've got available, from my, my perspective, you know, mulch materials, uh, I don't really care too much if it's leaves or if it's hay or if it's straw or if it's, if it's wood chips. The more biologically healthy the soil is, the um, less you need to worry uh, about things like fresh wood chips. Um, certainly the basic model is nature doesn't till things into the ground. Nature drops things onto the surface and then they're used by soil life and by earthworms and things as and when necessary. So that's one basic point. I think if you had a, if you were taking a field that had been, you know, sprayed with Roundup for 20 years and um, were to make your beds and cover them with wood chips, probably you wouldn't, that wouldn't be the right, that would not be the right thing to do. Um, um, but as long as you have some decent, decent level of biological activity, I think they're, I think they're okay, um, based on my experience, not what I thought I understood. Um, so what happens to your irrigation tape during all this? I mean, you have to just pull it all out each year and re reapply it because you got all these layers and... Um, so we'll talk about the uh, planting and transplanting process momentarily, but um, I generally put the drip tape down before I put the mulch in. Uh, after I plant, before I put the mulch down, is when I put the drip tape down. Um, and then by the end of the year, uh, um, sometimes I have to m apply mulch again in the middle of the year because it all gets eaten up. Um, um, so by the end of the year, when the cover crops are being put in, uh, um, it's it's basically exposed. It's you know, easy, you can you can see it. Um, the question is whether I'm going to be going through and re-upping the beds with the uh, tractor and the bed former. So in which case, if that's going to be happening. I have to pull the drip tape out, pull the header pipe out, um, so I can get through there and not screw stuff up. So um, uh, we do oftentimes you know un unhook all the drip tape and sort of tie it together in bundles of ten lines and sort of leave it on the side of the field and then bring it back and use it the next year. Um, so, uh, we've got, yeah, lines, <laughs> areas where there's big lines of drip tape stockpiled that are getting, about to get put back into the field right now, uh, but they've been left out during the winter, um, out of the field. Sometimes I'd leave it in, but then you got to deal with it at some point anyways. So, um, it's better just to get it out of the field in the fall and put it away and, um, yeah, it's a, it's a job to put it back on, but it's not that big of a deal. Okay. Is, is there anything else you need to add if you just cover it with mulch to keep all the organisms alive? Do they go dormant or die? I mean, I'm, I worry there's a huge die-off and you almost want to keep them fed through the winter with... The mulch is, the mulch is basically the food. I mean, the organic, the organic matter, well, depends on how warm the winter is, how much mulch you put down. A couple of years ago, we had, you know, not much winter and I thought I had plenty of mulch down on the ground. In areas where I was picking salad greens into, through November into you know, Thanksgiving, I didn't have time to put the cover crops in. And so I, put, I just took big old round bales of hay and I just rolled them out on the field. And by the middle of February, the soil was bare because it was so warm that the soil life stayed active and was just... And I had you know, the other places where I had, you know, I thought good solid cover crops or, you know, I had let my lettuce plants go to seed and the, the plants were pretty tight. It looked like a pretty good cover of, you know, three foot tall lettuce plants. I was like, that's my cover crop. Well, they were, they were just like <laughs> sucked into the soil. The soil was bare. It wasn't enough. So you have to, the only way, I mean, how, what is enough is determined by going out there looking at it and seeing. Um, and the different environmental conditions determine, um, I mean, it's not a static number or quantity. It depends, in, in my neck of the woods, it depends entirely on the warmth of the winter. The warmer the winter is, the more the ground's thawed out, the more they're gonna be eating organic matter. Um, and the less, um, you know, conversely, the colder it is, the less they'll eat.
So it's a continuum. <clears throat> um, yes? Um, I have a question about your tomato planting. Yes. Um, I've tried letting tomatoes, not pruning them, not stringing them up, and letting them sprawl, and it was just a harvest of nightmare. Yeah. How do you do that? How do we do that? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, cost-benefit analysis. Maybe it is a little bit of a harvesting nightmare. Um, I, uh, yeah, if I've got a hoop house full of tomatoes, that's, um, there's, you sort of ma end up making spots where you sort of jump to, and you get your five <laughs> gallon bucket, and then there's that one spot where the late blight came, so you got a little, you know, landing area there with the big bu buckets, and my kids are out there, we chuck tomatoes across the hoop house. I'm picking and whipping, and they're catching and dropping them in the box, and they miss, and they get hit in the face, and it's, or whatever, you know. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> it's playtime. I don't know. Um, sometimes I do actually. T t so two years ago, I didn't end up getting everything tied up and just let it go rampant, and that was great. That was fine. It was a little bit hard to walk, but um, <clears throat> um, uh, last year I did. You know what I traditionally do when I actually do tie things up was I, I put a uh, fence posts in every ten feet, um, and I'd run um, electric fence line. Uh, between, you know, at, you know, one foot, two feet, three and a half feet, five feet, seven feet, something like that, electric fence line, and then I'll just take the roll of twine string and sort of keep them from falling over under the ground, to sort of keep them held in, basically, and then depending on the year and how well they're doing, um, sometimes I'll put a, um, a, like a piece of wood between the two fence posts in the, in the like here's one line right here, and here's one line right here. So a piece of wood right here at seven feet, and then I'll run electric fence line. Um, you know, basically making a trellis, right. um, and then once they get to seven feet, they just sort of flop over. Instead of going up one side and coming down the other, um, they go up and then they flop over. And so you're basically picking on all three sides, on you know, left, right, and, and above. Um, so, yeah, um, how's that? <laughs> Ish. <laughs> is that polytwine or metal electric fence? Uh, the electric fence line is the stuff going between the posts. Is is the you know you can get a half mile of wire, wire. I guess. Yeah. yeah okay. So it's metal, not. Metal. metal. Yeah. And second question was, and you're still not suckering. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Correct. <laughs> but your vines are seven feet tall. On the way to getting <laughs> taller. <laughs> Once they, you know, anybody ever had them go up one side of the fence post and down the other side and then. Yeah, so give them a spot to go up to that's a, a good level for you and then let them go horizontal. And they want to go this way, they want to go that way, they want to go this way. It's, you got a, basically a grape arbor. Um, yeah. I find that it's about fair. Yeah. Do you have any animal <coughs> systems on your farm? Animal what? Animal systems. Chickens, species. Chickens, cows, yeah. Okay. And do, do you combine those systems with your vegetable growing systems in any way? I will run the chicken tractors through the cropland, um, oftentimes at the end of the year. Okay. Um, but the cows don't really go in the field, no. And after you run them through, you're putting down mulch, because you're, are, are you running through an even bare soil? That's how I'm going to clear a bed, is run the chickens over it. Are you mulching them? Um, generally, uh, Depends. Okay. <laughs> Depends on the process, uh, yeah, did we talk about grain and soaking? I don't think we talked about soaking grain last yesterday. Um, so um, <coughs> chickens oftentimes eat grain, um, right? Uh, so people know about this thing with, uh, it's called the phytase inhibitors. Yep. You know how grain is by definition indigestible, right? It's objective, it's se seeds in general, uh, is to come in one end and come out the other end in a beautiful fertility package and germinate, right? It is designed to be not digestible. There's this thing called phytase inhibitors which inhibit digestion, um, all seeds. And so traditional cultures would always soak their grains before they cook them, um, which tricks the seed into thinking that it's germinating and releases these phytase inhibitors which makes it digestible. Um, so if you don't soak the seed, but in the case of chicken grain, you take the seed and you crack it, crush it, turn it into a little pellet, 
Um, as soon as it's A is it's A still indigestible, still has the phytase inhibitors, which make it indigestible, and then as soon as it's cracked, it begins to go rancid. Um, so basically, you're taking something that has some significant nutritional value and decreasing it, um, um, and making it more expensive. Raw grain, you know, doesn't cost very much. Actually, the farmers don't get paid very much <laughs> per bushel of corn. Fifty pounds a bushel of corn goes for three dollars or something to the farmer, right? Um, if you took the raw grain and you put it in a five-gallon bucket of water overnight and then poured it out onto a seedling tray and let it sit there for two days, it would begin to sprout. And the nutritional value goes up. People know about this, about sprouting stuff? The nutri nutritional value goes up once a, once a seed is sprouted. Right? It's, not only is it digestible, but the actual nutrient levels go up, which is, don't ask chemists how that works with the, uh, who was it? Conservation of matter? Who is it? <laughs> who's, who's, whose law was that? Somebody's three laws of the conservation of matter. Um, yeah, anyway, we, uh, we know this. The scientific data says that the nutri nutrient levels go up after the seed is, is, is soaked. So um, I will generally buy a mix of whole grains, put them in a bucket of water, um, overnight, pour them out onto a tray, let them sit for a couple days, and then that's my chicken grain, which doesn't all get eaten, and oftentimes gets sort of, you know, scratched into the ground, which then germinates, which is actually a way of planting cover crops, is you bring your, you bring your chickens through, mm -hmm. and you give them a little bit too much grain to eat, and they scratch it around, and, you know, lo and behold, you know, two days later, uh, you've got cover crops germinating in that in the field. So there's all kinds of ways of doing it. Um, they can I bring them through an area of, you know, um, I don't know what it would be, broccoli plants at the end of the season, and they can eat them all down. And there's good mulch on the ground. Uh, it depends entirely on the circumstance, what you do afterwards. But there's all kinds of ways of playing it to get multiple things accomplished. Yeah. All right. Any more questions, or should I get going on the agenda? If you put some whey in with that chicken feed and mm -hmm. feed it to them that day, I think it makes a ferment that's really good for them. A whey into, into, the, into the feed? Yeah. Cool. You can soak it for as much as a week where we live. Now it's colder and it is here, but we'll fill the bucket. It, it, it probably doesn't take us a whole week to go through a bucket. It'll be mixed grains, water, whey if we've got it, and then it, either way it's going to ferment. It's going to ferment better with the whey in yeah. there. No and way. it doesn't, nothing bad happens to it. <laughs> Chickens seem to be happy, so <laughs> they haven't had any die for a while. Yeah. <clears throat> One more question in the back, and then we'll get we'll get uh, started on the agenda. Did I see a hand up back there? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so why aren't you mixing your minerals in with your chicken food? <laughs> let, <laughs> let them broadcast it for you. Uh, so that's one thing they do generally put into chicken grain when they make when they build the pellets is all these minerals. So. Oftentimes, I will have a little a bag of chicken minerals, um, actually a, a black dish. Um, but you don't do your soil amendment minerals. That would kill your chickens, right? <laughs> probably. Um, yeah, boron in significant quantities probably um, haven't expo experimented with uh, <laughs> what the, how much boron it takes to kill a chicken. <laughs> uh, about the other couple of weeks ago about nitrogen. It's like chickens are the nitrogen. It was still the NPK yeah. paradigm. So nitrogen is so volatile. How do you get that out there in a time, timely fashion, right? Yeah. So if you put anhydrous out there, if it doesn't rain in a couple of days, and you've wasted your money because it's all volatilized. So I'm not going to spend money on nitrogen because it's, it's putting it into the air. But if I put it into the chickens, then they put it on the soil in proper dosages. But so, I'm just generalizing the random idea to... I, I, I think I made this point, but I'm not sure if it's stuck. Um, all plants in nature have the species, have, they've evolved the relationships with, with species of bacteria and fungi on their leaf surface to access nitrogen from the atmosphere directly and, f and, and access as much as they need when they need it. This idea that we need to add nitrogen is foundationally, you know, is only in the case where the plants aren't able to feed themselves, right? So 
we're, we're assuming a broken system if we think we need to add nitrogen in the first place. Uh, I don't, this is a, maybe it's a bit of a brain twister in too early in the day. I'll repeat it later if you'd like. But the idea is <laughs> that in nature, plants have the ability to harvest all the nitrogen they need from the atmosphere. They, you, you should not need to add nitrogen, um, full stop. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't have to say about that. Um, I mean, that, that example that you're giving is sort of a comment I wanted to make. Like, I felt hopeful about how resilient nature is. We have interrupted so much of the elegance that it has. Yeah. And, you know, the showing all the different threads, all the different ways of them weaving back together. You know, and the resilience that, like, you know, in a couple of generations, a seed will be able to... Be totally powerful and kicking. And, yeah, and you, you buy a store-bought seed that has been, you know, jacked up on soluble nutrients for the past 18 generations, and it's not going to do well immediately in a well-functioning biological ecosystem. You need to actually, you know, re it. remember it, <laughs> help it remember its nature. Um, so, yeah, these, we, all these pieces are broken, but in principle, we can fix them. And, um, yeah, I, I hope you left feeling hopeful. I, that's my... <laughs> I feel very hopeful about what's, what, <laughs> what's, what's possible. Yeah, I, I, I hear this thing, it's, people keep referring to this idea where some people are feeling depressed about the state of things. Has anybody heard about this? <laughs> like they get worked up, they're like, oh, the politics and oh, the something, something, like really? <coughs> we have so much opportunity. Like you're just gonna sit back and get depressed Really? <coughs> we, we, we have everything we need. We can totally do this. It's on us. We, I mean, we can totally do this. Yeah. I, I don't, I'll, there's no other place to put your energy as far as I'm concerned. You hear about this one? Where you put your energy is where your energy goes. You know that one? Where you put your mind, right? Where you put your energy, what you think about, what you talk about, what you spin off on, that's where your energy just went. You don't bitch and moan about anybody else until you clean up your own act. I mean, we, we all have the power. We are totally capable of, of busting this thing out. But we've got to take responsibility for ourselves and stop bitching and moaning about other people, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you very much. Amen. I'll take an amen on the sound Sunday morning. Yeah. <laughs> amen. Amen. <laughs> Bum, ba -dum, bum, 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 bum. One of the last slides yesterday was uh, you talked about foliar, foliar, can't spit it out. Foliar spring? Right. Yeah. Um, and I was waiting till today because I think you were going to cover it more. Yes. But, you know, in essence, I mean, don't get me wrong, like there's the ideal and then there's kind reality. of current reality. Yep. And for people that have invested in the time, energy, effort, and have their livelihood on plants that are currently in the ground, yep. are running out of steam, have you know, clear signs of chlorosis happening, yeah. nitrogen deprived, they need to get yes. food. Um, that's one of those situations to where, you know, in a vacuum or just kind of, like, there's this ideal and that's great, but then there's, again, what do you there's do? There's reality. In yeah. The, yeah. Like, my so, question is, what do you do? Not necessarily, how, like, how do you handle a situation in which you're not, your soil, or for whatever reason, something's happening to where those ideal ranges aren't currently in existence, <coughs> and you need to engage. Yeah, um, or what, you know, I mean, so I don't think I ever said that you shouldn't use compost, or that it's a bad thing, necessarily. I don't think I ever said that you shouldn't use liquid fish, or kelp, or bone meal, or blood meal, or anything like that. I mean, I, I'm, it, I understand that there are tools in the toolbox, and that making a living comes first, and is a priority, and I have no problem with that. Um, I um, <clears throat> simply am personally unwilling to put certain tools in my toolbox. Um, I, don't, I don't have liquid fish in my toolbox. I don't have compost in my toolbox. Um, we all have our little things we do. You know, you can call it being obnoxious or dogmatic or pedantic or, you know, arrogant or, I mean, all kinds of words probably could be appropriately used. Um, um, I will generally, you know, revert to some basic things like keeping the soil moist, keeping it covered, 
Um, I do have, you know, um, mixed sort of foliar sprays that have a, a suite of different elements in them. Um, I, and I do and I do inoculants as well. So um, beyond, you know, like a, a, a prophylactic dose of basic elements at a rate of, you know, a half a gallon per acre um, or a foliar inoculant of, you know, two ounces per acre of, of um, as a foliar spray, um, maybe uh, if I see diseases or pests um, and I really actually want to try to, you know, bring the plant to the next level of vitality, I will sometimes use essential oils um, at a, you know, a cup per acre. Um, but um, yeah, I'm personally on my system, I don't do side dressing or, or anything like that. Um, um, and maybe I'm losing yield, um, um, but I figure that's part of, I, I, I want to give myself a challenge, I guess. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I make enough money. I got plenty of crops. Things are going, you know, just fine. So I don't feel like I need to um, add these things. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question or not. You are, but I mean, there's kind of a follow-up to that, which is, and this is something we talked about yesterday. You had mentioned it would be better to present it here in this context, but it's this idea that, you know, when you're, when you're farming a particular crop, mm -hmm. uh, whatever the crop is, that crop is drawing certain particular things out of it more than other things, right? Yeah. Which is part of the rotation, not just the disease rotation, but also because legumes that are inoculated are known to <coughs> be more kind of bringing in the nitrogen, whereas something like brassicus or whatever is <coughs> going to be using that nitrogen more than other crops. Um, and so if you have the same crop in the same space and you're harvesting that crop, taking it off site and you're not replenishing it, the question is where is it like, and I get yeah. it, like, if you keep <coughs> remineralizing it, you're going to, but I guess, you know, what's your answer to that? That's a, a perfect segue to the handout, so we'll just, I'll just give you a short answer and then we'll get into it. Um, um, so I, my, my thought form is that I am going to be taking out um, 20,000 pounds of crops per acre, ballpark, I don't know what the exact number is, and as I understand the science, you know, at least... 18,000 of those pounds are actually air and water, um, carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. Um, um, but a couple of thousands, or at least 500, maybe a couple thousand pounds are actually minerals from the soil, um, if you actually do the math. Um, and so uh, I have, what I do every spring, pretty much when I'm planting, is, um, you know, now that I don't do my soil tests and add minerals based on the fact that my tank is in decent shape, is uh, every spring, I'll put down about a thousand pounds of various minerals. So, 100 pounds of limestone, 100 pounds of rock phosphate, uh, on an acreage basis. I'll give you the recipe in a little bit. Um, so, that's my, that's how I sort of top off the tank. Um, is my thought is I'm going to be, I'm going to be pulling all this, all these minerals out of the soil this year. I want to put back now what I'm going to be pulling out, so that at the end of the year my tank is full. Um, and that's in an annual cropping system. I don't do that on the perennial land. I think in the perennial land where you have the much more well-established root systems and the polycultures going on, that there's you know, different factors at, at play that really do keep things balanced fairly well, um, um, which we'll talk about later today. Um, so in the annual, in the annual you know, monoculture annual system, I do put some minerals back every year um, to balance out what I think I'm taking out.